All right, good afternoon. Um, it's time for the first uh, keynote of this conference. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming Sean Eddy. Uh, Sean is the Elmer C. Patterson Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Harvard University, and is also a Howard Hughes medical investigator. And he will be talking about computational analysis of RNA structure and function. Thank you, Sean. All right, you can hear me okay? Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here, and I want to talk about a problem that I've been interested in actually for a very long time, and in fact, over 30 years ago, was standing right here talking about this problem. And so the story I'm going to tell you is that through stubbornness and persistence and probably some aspect of also being slow, we've actually essentially solved this problem. I became interested in group one self-splicing introns many years ago. These are RNA catalysts. They were discovered more or less contemporaneously with the discovery of RNA catalysis by Tom Cech, uh, Norm Pay, Sid Altman, and others. And they were the first introns to be found in bacteria. So we were told at the time that RNA splicing is a eukaryotic feature and there's no RNA splicing in bacteria. But then these introns were found in bacteria. They're not the kind that you might be used to. They're not spliceosomal introns. They're not like eukaryotic introns. They have complicated 2D and 3D structures. So three of these introns with these particular catalytic structures were found in the genome of bacteriophage T4, an E. coli um, virus, in the genes for thymidylate synthase, nucleotide reductase, and a gene that at the time was of unknown function and is now known to be the anaerobic nucleotide reductase. So there were a whole bunch of evolutionary questions. It was very surprising to find introns in a bacterium, in a bacterial system, like a bacterial virus. They shouldn't be there. Bacterial viruses are super under selection. Their genomes are very compact. Why would they have introns? And so a bunch of the questions around this were, are these the only three that are in there? How many of these introns are out there? Are they in bacteria? What viruses are they in? Can we search for them? And so even at the time, this is pre-blast, but even at the time, we had the ability to search for similar sequences. Well, too bad. These are catalytic RNAs. They conserve their secondary structure, but not much of their sequence. So you can't just take a sequence similarity search, Smith-Waterman or something, and sweep through genomes looking for more of these. You have to do something more complicated. That's shown in a little bit more detail here. This is the now known crystal structure of an example group one intron showing the three-dimensional structure. And the point that I want you to take away is that these long things are A-form or essentially A-form RNA helices. The catalytic structure, the three-dimensional structure, um, is largely determined by the arrangement of helices. Those helices are the secondary structure, shown here and in the same color code as the three-dimensional structure. And another thing that I'll point out on this slide that's a, not really easy to see, but there's only one conserved residue in this catalytic structure, and that's a guanosine residue right there in the active site involved in the transesterification reaction. The rest of the conservation of these particular molecules is actually in the secondary structure and not the sequence. So that makes them difficult to find in genome sequence comparisons. And at the time I got interested in this, I was a biologist interested in RNA catalysis. And I asked my computational buddies, I want to be able to search for an RNA secondary structure and not for a similar sequence. And they said, ha ha, unsolved problem, will never be solved, not possible. But it's a problem that's very um, general across lots of interesting RNAs. This is a different RNA now, one small enough to sort of put on a slide. This is a so-called riboswitch. This is a SAM1 riboswitch. It binds to a molecule called SAM, S adenosylmethionine, shown there in sort of atomic outline. Riboswitches uh, switch their structure in response to small molecule ligands and are used as cis-regulatory elements in a lot of bacterial genes. That's the three-dimensional structure of the SAM riboswitch wrapped around its ligand. 
This is the two-dimensional structure that we draw as a planar structure for RNAs in general with all the little Watson-Crick base pairs and their helices. In this case, just four helices, really. And then in between is something that RNA biologists will often draw called, that we'll sort of jokingly call a 2.5G structure where it's the same stems, but now for the ones that are coaxially stacked. So you see P4 and P1 make one coaxial stack by sort of twisting around here. So there's P4 stacked on P1, there's P2 stacked on P3, and then there's a little interaction called a pseudonaut that I'll explain further in a subsequent slide where loop-to-loop -loop connections are happening. By the time you've got all of those base pairing interactions down, you've pretty much constrained the three-dimensional structure. So one important point here is that RNA biologists by eye have been predicting three-dimensional structures of RNA to pretty good accuracy long before alpha fold and the rest of it. So protein folding is much harder than this. RNA folding, once you've got the secondary structure, you can pretty much get to the three-dimensional structure at low res um, as a human. And the secondary structure then, an important point is that it becomes obvious in comparative genomics because the molecule is being evolutionarily uh, uh, constrained to maintain the base pairing interactions. So now what I'm showing you is a multiple sequence alignment of different SAM1 ribose switch sequences from a variety of species. This happens to come from an alignment from the RFAM, the RNA sequence families databases, that originally contained 433 sequences, and I truncated it down. And it also is a little bit longer than this, and so I cut out the middle just to, to be able to fit it on a slide. And now what you're looking at across the bottom is some code for where the base pairs are. So this open and closed bracket structure, this is, these are consensus base pairs. I'm also drawing the same interactions with these, cross, with these arcs. And in green are compensatory base changes. So where evolution has changed one base, but to maintain the base pairing interaction, it changes the other one too. And that's an extremely distinctive sig signature in RNA sequence alignments. You don't get anything like this really uh, nowhere near this strength in protein sequence alignments. The Watson-Crick base pairing interactions show up as these very strong pairwise, disjoint, and nested correlations. The only thing that breaks the nesting, I said I was going to say a little bit more about this, are the so-called pseudonauts. The algorithms that we use for RNA structure prediction that are automated tend to be unable to deal with these crossing interactions. They tend to build structures inside out or outside in, so they can only deal with nested pairwise interactions, and they give up on pseudonauts. So if you've used mFold from Michael Zucker or things like it, that's why they don't deal with, with pseudonauts. So in green are all the, par all the compensatory substitutions. In blue are things that are single flips. RNA allows GU pairing, for example, and so when you get a GC to a GU substitution for a, for a pair that's consistent with the structure but not really a full covariation. And then because it's biology, there's, in, there's also occasional inconsistencies. One thing I want you to pay attention to is how much green is on this figure. I'm going to show you a counterexample in, in a few slides. This is very typical of real structural RNAs, but there's a tremendous amount of information in the covariation. So much so that you can do very simple statistics. You can do a mutual information calculation that simply takes all columns of a multiple sequence alignment I and all columns J and does the all versus all of if you tell me the identity of the residue at position I, how much information in bits do I get about J? If you have perfect correlation, you get two bits of information. So this could be A, C, G, or U. But if that A has to be paired to a U, the C has to be paired to a G, this guy has zero bits of information as sequence in information, but there's two bits of information in the, in the correlation. The top right triangle is showing you a covariation analysis of the SAM1 ribose switch alignment, 400 sequences. And the lower triangle is the true secondary structure, the classical non-nested, uh, the classical nested secondary structure of the SAM1 ribose switch. What I want you to see is that the structure is pretty much completely known from this very trivial mutual information analysis. And, and even the pseudonaut and some tertiary contexts, if you look at the more subtle signals, are reflected in this pairwise covariation. 
The sa- again, the same thing for protein is super subtle and, and difficult to analyze, but in the case of RNA, very easy to see. And RNA biologists have been doing this for like forever. Carl Woese, working with Robin Guttel and others in the very early days of ribosomal RNAs, was already predicting the secondary structure of SSU and LSU ribosomes on horrible old CRT terminals. This is an actual figure I got from Robin Guttel. I think Robin published it at 1.2, of Carl just saying, this is obvious, that the, the covariation that you're going to get in RNA sequence alignments has to be there because of the nature of base pairing. This probably needs no explanation. We're going to be able to produce these RNA alignments in an iterative way. Like if you have a guess at the structure, you align the sequences based on that guess. You need to know the structure to get a good alignment. And then given a good alignment, you can make a better structure prediction. Robin made an entire career out of this and got the SSU and LSU ribosomal secondary structures to 98 plus percent accuracy in terms of base pairing long before we had crystal structures of these molecules. We had three-dimensional structure predictions of RNAs based on not just the base pairing but also the covariation between loops that were pretty accurate. So I was influenced by all of this work. I knew that there was a lot of computational information that was available in RNA sequence alignments and that we needed better methods to be able to harness it. Using this signal, this covariation signal, you can do a lot of stuff. I wanted to be able to use it for homology search, to incorporate it in BLAST-like tools that were secondary structure aware. Robin and Carl and many other people in the field, Norm Pace et al., were using it for structure prediction because once you know where the base pairs are, you can make a consensus secondary structure. But then a very important other thing that you can do is there's lots of conserved regions in genomes, and this is a telltale signal that a conserved region, if it also has this covariation signal, is telling you that that conserved region is being conserved because it's a structural RNA as opposed to all the other things that could lead to sequence conservation. So with that in mind, let me now take a little bit of a detour away from homology search, which is what a a lot of my work is concerned with, and, and tell you about that problem, because I think it's underappreciated that that is a different problem. Usually, we're in the situation where I give you an alignment of a structural RNA, and the question is, what is the structure of this structural RNA? You're trying to do structure prediction. But if I give you a conserved region from a genome, and you're asking, is that a conserved RNA structure or not, that's a question of that's more about statistical significance. Is there enough covariation data to conclude that that's more than you would have expected by chance or by phylogenetic confounding signal that tends to generate a little covariation just because of the phylogenetic tree? And the reason this became particularly important is because, as many people probably know, there's now an enormous literature about what are called long non-coding RNAs. You do your RNA-seq experiment, you find a bunch of transcripts, You don't want to think that they're just transcriptional noise. They must have a function. And so people are trying to find functions for all these transcripts that don't appear to be coding for proteins that are being found, like in the human and other other genomes. So there's a lot lot of controversy about this field. And one of the controversies in it is whether any of those molecules have a conserved secondary structure. If a long non-coding RNA had a conserved secondary structure, there's almost it's almost incontrovertible. It'll have, it'll have a function. There's no reason that biology would actually evolutionarily conserve a secondary structure unless that secondary structure had some function. By and large, coding regions do not need a conserved secondary structure, but functional RNAs often do. So papers started appearing in the 2010s where some of the key long non-coding RNAs were showing up with uh, papers claiming that they had evolutionarily conserved secondary structures. This one sort of lit us up in particular in my lab because we happen to know, and not many people have sort of caught on yet, this is actually a coding region that's 200 amino acids plus, and it's sort of mind-boggling that people have missed it, and it's not a non-coding RNA, but never mind. The story that I want to tell you, and this is something that I really want you to take away if you ever work on RNA, you will see people write papers about how RNAx has a lovely, intricate, modular secondary structure. This is the sequence of the hot air long non-coding RNA from human 2100 nucleotides folded with the, uh, this is not what is in the paper, this is just to make a point. Run it through a folding program, you get a structure. 
The structure has an energy of negative 708 kcals per mole. Take exactly the same sequence and shuffle it, make a random sequence with the same base composition, run it through the same RNA folding program, and you get a structure that looks just as good. This is really important. Do negative controls is one of the take-home points. RNA always folds. Random sequences always fold. You can't make an RNA sequence without having it fold in the test tube. So there's a bunch of great technologies that we have now for probing RNAs chemically and enzymatically called shape probing and DMS probing and what have you. And again, these technologies assume that there's a functional RNA structure present, and they try to figure out what it is. They're trying to enable structure prediction. But they do not distinguish whether that is an evolutionarily conserved functional structure versus any structure you would get from any RNA. If you made a random sequence and put it in a test tube, you could shape probe it, you could DMS probe it, it will have a structure. Energies of negative 688 kcals per mole I will remind you that my minus one for every minus 1.4 kcals, that's tenfold in KD. The amount of this molecule that is unfolded is zero molecules are unfolded. Every molecule in that test tube is, secondary, is in secondary structure. The secondary structure is contributing one to two kcals per Watson-Crick base pair. RNA is sticky. It will always fold, even if it's random. Have I belabored the point enough? So you you. Just because you're seeing a structure does not mean that structure does anything. So the question is, are these structures that people are seeing for long non-coding RNAs functional? Are they evolutionary conserved? Is that structure constraining the evolution of the sequence? And this paper from 2015 lit up my group because it was one of the first ones that really showed a picture that we were familiar with with the same color code that I was showing you earlier of green re representing covariant base, base pairs, red uh, reflecting conserved base pairs in this, in this case, where they're just invariant, and blue representing half flips. So we looked at this big, big non-coding RNA structure with all this green covariation, and we said, well, if it's got covariation, it's under constraint. And then we made the mistake of reading the methods. And the method said the covariance was calculated using this program called R2R from Ron Breaker's group, from Sasha Weinberg. And R2R is a brilliant visualization program that's used to represent the secondary structure consensus of ribose switches. Ron Breaker's group is one of the best groups at finding ribose switches. And as a visualization program, what it does is it assumes the ribose switch is correct. They've already done a bunch of biology, and they just try to make a pretty picture of it. And in the R2R paper, it actually says this picture does not reflect the extent or the confidence of the covariation. There is no method that people are using yet to assign confidence to covariation. So everybody up till then was using mutual information calculations to do structure prediction, where you know the structure is there and you're just trying to find it, as opposed to distinguishing whether you've got enough information to conclude that you're under constraint versus not under constraint by an RNA structure. So we got all hot about this and talked to people at meetings, including one of the authors, Carissa Samamatsu, and, and Carissa said, well, I, I get the point, but we're just experimentalists. What are we supposed to be using? Do you guys have some fancy program for calculating the statistical significance of, of secondary structure? And so we took that up as a challenge, and Elena Rivas developed such a program that we call Rscape that I'll tell you a little bit about in the next couple slides. And what it does is takes an alignment like this, which happens to be a piece of the uh, hot air alignment, just to make a point, where now I want you to take away that there's almost no green on this. There is no covariation on this except for one pair, CG. That's a pair that gets lit up in green by R2R, because the rule that R2R uses is any pair of columns that show any compensatory change, pair change relative to consensus, color it green. There's no statistical testing whatsoever. Most of the change in here is inconsistent with the proposed secondary structure or half compensatory, which is consistent but not covariation. So all of the changes turn out to be of this sort where they're really more consistent with the statistical noise. And once we had a statistical test that could give you an E value a P or a P value for statistical significance, taking into account the noise that's generated by the phylogeny itself, all of this is insignificant. There is no evidence for conserved secondary structure in any of the long non-coding RNAs that we've studied 
with one special exception that I can tell you about that has more to do with RNA processing than with the link RNA itself. The group sort of, to my surprise, came back and rebutted this, and then we rebutted them, and then we rebutted them again. And so I'm just going to show you one point from this continuing argument that I, I think is a, a useful point as opposed to just two groups going at each other's throats. And that's that what they did next was they said, ah, you guys used the wrong statistic. It was like, well, it's our program. We sort of know what statistic to use. And they, turn, they turned on an option in our software that uses a different covariation statistic. So now the thing to know is that RNA biologists have developed a whole bunch of different pairwise statistics for different uses. Mutual information is pure covariation. It's a, it's a measure of pairwise covariation. But you might be interested in structure prediction, and you might want to say, well, if it's a completely conserved GC pair, that's at least consistent with RNA structure. So maybe it's being conserved because it's a base pair, so I want that to be rewarded. So one of the, the statistics in the literature was this thing called RAFS-P, never mind what it stands for, which is exactly that. It was a test for consistency with a structure. And if you switch and use that instead of mutual information, then they said, now we're getting significant p-values for hot air again. And we produced this figure. This is synthetic identical sequences. There is no variation in this whatsoever, so there cannot be any covariation. And with that statistic, you still get significant p-values for that because it's a conserved base pair. There's no covariation, but, it's a, but that's also consistent with conservation. You're not distinguishing conservation from covariation. And that's exactly the case that they're getting in, in hot air. So there's still no evidence for covariation. The authors still don't accept this. Uh, but the point that I want you to take, take away is that there is a big difference between trying to predict an RNA structure where you will take advantage of being consistent with the structure versus the business of trying to distinguish when you have a conserved RNA when you really want to use the pure statistic. We've actually removed that statistic from the software now so that it is not possible to uh, make this mistake again with our software. All right. The real use of Elena's r -escape program is on real structure RNAs, things that really do have a conserved structure. And the RFAM database, the RNA families database, has been doing a, a, a good job of taking advantage of this. And I'll show you this, this example now, again, with the SAM1 riboswitch. The original RFAM structure is shown with the base pairs here in black. These additional green things are the things that have been called as significant pairing interactions by Elena's software. And Elena's software also picks up the pseudonaut, the four bases of this pseudonaut. Now, I want to make a point about this lone base pair, because I guess the point is you can get most of the stems of an RNA right, but what you really want to do often is you want to get to this 2.5D structure, and if you don't see the pseudonaut, it's hard to get to the 2.5D structure. And it turns out even some of these things, these single base pairs, are super crucial to get uh, before you can get to the 2.5D structure. And the reason for that is, remember the coaxial stacking. I need to be able to deduce that P1 is stacked on P4 and P2 is stacked on P3. The diagnostic thing for that is that there's no space in between the last base pair of that stem and the last one so that they can actually fold together like two tin cans or something and be coaxial. So I can't tell who's stacked on who until I see that space go away. So those two base pairs are critical to recognizing that that's a coax stack. And that lone base pair, so base pairs normally have to stack together. You don't get lone base pairs. But this, the reason that that base pair is stable is because it's stacked on that one, not that one. And so until you see that that's a statistically significant interaction, you don't realize, oh, it's stacked on that. That's the coax stack, and you can get all the way to this. So the new RFAM structure, guided by Elena's software, gets all of this right, gets to the 2.5D structure, and gets quite close to a, the beginnings of a 3D structure. And the RFAM team has been applying that systematically. OK, <clears throat> so my problem is homology search. I wanted the ability to use this signal to do a search for structural RNA homologs that takes into account both their sequence and their structure conservation. I knew at the time how to do what's called a profile-hidden Markov model. Profile-hidden Markov models are linear models that take a multiple sequence alignment, break it into columns that are treated independently. 
make a profile with 20 scores or four scores, depending on whether you're protein or RNA, at each consensus position, add states for insertion and deletion relative to consensus, insertion and deletion penalties or probabilities, the emission of the residues or probabilities, there's good probability theory for setting all the parameters, this generalizes BLAST and, be and became a pretty good model implemented in our software Hammer and other software packages for modeling protein domains, for example. But for RNA, I can't treat these individual positions as independent. I have long distance pairwise correlations. And it turned out that there were models called stochastic context-free grammars in the lit linguistics literature from the 1950s that are an appropriate model for this that I didn't know about. Yasu Sakakibara did know about, so coming from the linguistics angle and me coming from the biology angle, we simultaneously, uh, I reinvented the wheel and, and Yasu applied the wheel to the problem of RNA structure uh, modeling, profile modeling, and there the key idea is you go to a binary tree. So instead of a line marching left to right, and instead of dynamic programming algorithms that are aligning a prefix that's growing to a prefix that's growing as you do Smith-Waterman sequence alignment, the RNA model is a binary tree that has states that are, have their little fingers on two columns at once. And the dynamic programming algorithms then work from the shortest possible sequences on the inside and add pairs working outward to do the alignment or, or the reverse. A big restriction of these models is that because of the binary tree nature, they can only model nested pairwise interactions. So pseudonauts can't be captured by an SCFG. They tend to be the minority of base pairs, so okay. So, but still, it's a, it's a cost that we, that we pay. And of course, as I'll show you again in the next slide in a little bit more detail, these algorithms are going to be more complicated. Now, every state of a HMM is touching one residue on the sequence, so the algorithms are quadratic in time and memory, just like Smith-Waterman or BLAST. But now aligning a sequence as the, the sort of uh, yield of a binary tree, every state has its hands on two positions in the sequence, so you're going to be at least cubic in memory, and it turns out because of splits in the sequence, there's three sequence coordinates and one model coordinate, so you're going to be N4 in time, and that's going to be bad. The models mirror the real secondary structures, so this is a tRNA, this is a uh, pr profile stochastic context-free grammar skeleton of tRNA. The stems are pair states that generate two residues or align to two residues at a time, and the model bifurcates following the bifurcating structure of the secondary structure. So any classical non-pseudonauted consensus secondary structure can be turned into one of these models and can be aligned to sequences with optimal dynamic programming align alignment algorithms um, you get something that looks like a blast or hammer alignment, but now with a little bit of infra extra information. This is a tRNA model to a tRNA sequence. The line across the top is an intricate code showing the different stems. So those open parentheses are paired to those closed parentheses, those open brackets to those closed brackets, and so on. And the middle match line is showing you you're getting positive score, even though that's a CG mismatch. The pair, the third base over, is a GC there, a CG there. So it's a compensatory base change. The colon is you're getting positive score from the pair, even though it looks like a mismatch of the two positions. So all that's great. Good probability theory behind it. Beautiful models. Um, exactly what we needed. And then here's the problem. N cubed memory and four time. So we had proof of principle many years ago, and we did not have the ability to apply this at scale. And this is the sort of rocky training montage thing where then over 20 years, we developed algorithm after algorithm after heuristic hack after, after heuristic hack to make these better and faster. And two key advances um, on the original stuff, one was to knock the memory down. So just like you can do divide and conquer um, to save memory in, in standard sequence alignment dynamic programming, there's a version of this that you can apply to profile stochastic context-free grammars, so I figured out how to do that. And then we figured out how to accelerate hammer to blast speed, and then we used those accelerations, which are heuristic accelerations, as our main accelerations in Infernal. So about, by about the mid-210s, 
2010s, we started to have a version of the software that could actually be used. And then a big milestone for us, we were collaborating with the RNA Families Database, RFAM, and because the infernal software for making profile models of RNAs was so slow, so compute intensive, what they had been doing was doing a pre-filter with BLAST to identify possible hits in the full sequence database and then only running this filtered set through profile SCFGs. We had never had the compute capability to run Infernal run profile SCFGs over the whole sequence database. And so starting in 2015, we could. And then what you're expecting, so one of the first tables that came out of that was Eric Naraki working in my lab, uh, putting together a table that said between the old number of hits that we got, including the terrible blast filter, versus the new hits, how many, how many more hits are we getting once we had the ability to look purely with secondary structure? Many RNAs are actually conserved at the sequence level, so the difference wasn't big. But we expected that the molecules that were really going to matter are these structural RNAs, like these are two ribose switches. That's the SAM ribose switch. That's the FMN ribose switch. These are two spliceosomal RNAs, U1 and U6, and those are the group 1 introns. The things that really rely on secondary structure for their function and not so much their sequence are going to be the things that we were missing in our fam. And sure enough, the thing where we found the most new hits were these molecules, including 11,000 new group 1 intron predictions. Now, the funny thing is we'd been working on this problem for so long in my lab that we had become a computational lab, an algorithms lab, and a stats lab, and had ceased to work on catalytic RNA or group 1 introns. And so I was the only person who remembered that this is why we got into it in the first place. And so Eric was sort of like baffled that I was jumping up and down when he showed me this table. And we found new group 1 introns throughout um, a lot of different organisms, including bacteriophage, which is what my lab is starting to work on now, actually. But the story I'll tell you a little bit briefly here at the end is one of the places we found them is, again, a place where they're not supposed to be. Archaea have introns, but archaea have a class of intron called bulge helix bulge introns. They're mostly in tRNAs. They're sometimes found in ribosomal RNAs. They have a particular little structure of their own. They're spliced by a protein. They're, they're spliced by the tRNA splicing into nuclease in, Ar in Archaea. And there was a group one introns had never been found there. You might know that there's a theory that the spliceosomal introns that we know and love in humans are descended from group two self-splicing introns. And this makes sense, and most of us accept it. And then there was this proposal, the speculation that maybe what's happened to the group one introns in Archaea is much like the group twos decayed into spliceosomal introns that are spliced by the spliceosome. Maybe group one introns have gone extinct in Archaea and became the BHBs. There's lots of these stories in the literature where we can't find ho interesting homologs in the whatever clade, Archaea, or whatever. And, and one of the hypotheses you should always keep in your head is maybe that's just because of the homology search tools hammer and blast and whatever are just not good enough to find them. And this was one of these cases because in that list of 10,000 new introns, I wouldn't be telling you this if it didn't turn out that the archaea are full of group 1 introns. And they just had not been seen because you didn't have the power to search for them. So Eric, Tom Jones in my lab, uh, wrote a little paper that was sort of like the culmination of many, many years of work that came full circle as we finally had the ability to search for these things and find them in interesting corners of biology. And these searches I can now run on my laptop where they used to take massive clusters in super, supercomputers. And that's where I want to leave you with. My lab has mostly stopped working on RNA experimentally. Maybe we'll get back to it. And now what we do is develop the software tools for homology search for RNAs, this software package called Infernal, where we collaborate with the RFAM database. And we really use this as a training exercise to learn how to do all this stuff, but Hammer, which is more widely used, which is the basis for many of the protein family databases, which is based on simpler models called profile hidden Markov models. And we collaborate with NCBI and especially with the European Bio Bioinformatics Institute to provide these as tools. And I will stop there. This is the lab. Nobody except my uh, Nick, our software engineer, and Tom, our secret agent man, actually works on the stuff I talked about. Everybody else, including all of our great graduate students, are actually working on other little lovable pieces of RNA biology that I could talk about in separate talks. I'll stop there and take questions.
questions? In the front. Thanks, Sean. Uh, great talk. Um, at the very beginning, you said something I thought you'd come back to, so I'm going to ask you to come back to it, which is how on earth can these uh, organisms under such selection even have introns? Have you had any more insights into that? Yeah, so this is actually well understood for the group one introns now. They're mobile elements. They are mobilized by protein, double-strand endonucleases called homing endonucleases. The protein is actually the business end. It introduces a double... If you have a mixed infection between phage with the intron and phage without the intron, the homing endonuclease cleaves site-specifically the guy without the intron, and the double-strand break is repaired by homologous recombination across the intron plus copy, and everybody comes out as progeny with the intron. So the intron is a stealth cloak. The endonuclease can now exist anywhere, including interrupting coding genes, but now it's silent because it's wrapped in something that self-splices it out of the M mRNA. So you get self-splicing, the mRNA goes off and is still an intact mRNA, and the homing endonuclease is encoded by the spliced intron RNA. So actually the mobility, the reason it's there, is a protein story. It's a mobile DNA story, and the intron's function is to hide that endonuclease from the system. And, the, and these things are all over the place. The mobile, the mobile endonucleases are in yeast mitochondria and tons of bacteria. They have different kinds of intron cloaks. They're found in group 2 introns. They're found in bulge helix bulge introns. They're found in intines, which are protein splicing. So the protein splices itself out at the protein level. And so there's a whole bunch of interesting biology around them that's different than the RNA catalysis story. So question here. Thanks. Um, so quasi-palindromes, imperfect palindromic sequences, can be made perfect by what's called transcription mutations, whereby replication fault collapses, you get a topic template, and then hold them back again. So that will, call, that will systematically cause correlated substitutions. To what extent do you think that's giving you false positive signals? A good case where we see that is when you have um, inverted repeat elements, uh, or even just having dense enough elements like having enough alus in the human genome sequence, exactly what you see happens. We, get, we see correlated substitution in alus and other kinds of elements that have inverted repeats. You'll get this in the, in, in, in whenever there's an inverted LTR, for example. And what I think is going on maybe is that you're getting a temporary cruciform and a base substitution on one side is getting DNA base repaired onto the other side. So that is that is one of the places that we get a false signal, potentially, and you have to watch out for that. And there's phylogeny is the big source of false signal. You get a spurious pair of substitutions at some deep branch of the phylogenetic tree, and then everybody underneath has the same pair, and so it looks like it's a correlated pair. That's the big source of confounding noise. And then it turns out that there's also some confounding signal from coding regions. There's enough information, sort of local correlation in the genetic code that you generate about a bunch of plus one and plus three pairwise covariation down the length of a coding region if you look hard enough. And so you have to be careful about that. But yeah, what you say is right. You get some confounding covariation off of inverted repeats. Question here? So, so this is uh, about alternative splicing. Um, is very common in the protein coding genes, and I think hot air is also alternative spliced. So my question is, uh, what is the impact of this alternative splicing at the structurally? How how the structure, how different would be structurally uh, that derived from the same gene? Uh, I didn't quite catch that. Say that again. Huh? Uh, the so RNA? the structure, how, how the impact of splicing on the structure, like uh, uh, the protein structure of a RNA. RNA structure. The impact of, for like example, in a catalytic intron? Like if, uh, if hot air has uh, producing different uh, transcripts due to alternative splicing, ah. and how different would be structurally those different products? Okay, I think I understand the question. Because you're going to make something like a link RNA mm -hmm. as a pre-mRNA. It's going to have its introns. And most of these link RNAs, not all of them, some of them are 
intronless, but many of them are, they're very mRNA-like, so they are pre-mRNA, they have introns. So nobody's really looked at this. I mean, we're still in the stage where it's controversial whether there's any important RNA structure at all. So my answer to the question right now, without a ton of, you know, really nailing the details, is that I believe that most of these things are coding regions that have been missed, or transcriptional noise that's low level and not conserved. And the spliceosome doesn't need a lot of information, so even transcriptional noise, if you just made a random RNA in a cell, my bet is that it's going to have in introns. It's, the spliceosome's going to find a GU and an AG and it's going to splice it. So I think I can only give you sort of a wishy-washy an answer of like, RNA structure matters, the spliceosome cares about RNA secondary structure, there are examples where the secondary structure matters for whether the splice is on correctly or, you know, alternative splicing control and stuff like that. And I also believe that the signals are so weak for spliceosomal splicing that random sequences also splice. And so any example would have to be, like, really carefully studied. And in the case of link RNAs, the only uh, structures that people are producing are for the mature, fully spliced RNAs at this point. Um, so the hot air secondary structure conservation was not very convincing, but for things like maybe EXIST, which is very conserved, and I think the function is probably conserved as well, have you looked into those structures? So that's a great question. Thank you for that question. EXIST is the one link RNA that I really do believe in with all my heart. <laughs> uh, obviously involved in X dosage compensation. It is extraordinarily highly conserved. That, act, that already puts it like way out on the, as an outlier relative to most link RNAs. Um, we can find homologs of that further down than dosage compensation exists. It looks like it came, other people have published that it might be a pseudogenized copy of a coding gene. We believe that story. We can find that homology too. I believe in it. But for structure, we do not see the signature of covariation. Many structures have been proposed for exist. Many of them been, have been supported by structure probing. When you look in detail, those structures are almost all different um, and not in agreement with each other, and we don't see covariation support for any of them. doesn't make them untrue, right, just because you lack the evidence to see it. But we now have added, Elena has added features onto Rscape that test for statistical power. So based on the amount of variation that we do have available in the alignment, if there was a structure, would you expect to see it? And those results also come back negative. We have exist alignments that are deep enough that if there was a normally conserved secondary, normally is a, uh, uh, carrying a lot of weight in that sentence, uh, normally conserved RNA secondary structure, we should have seen it, we don't see it. Thank you. Now, I guess the other thing to add is RNAs don't have to have a secondary structure have a function, right? There's all kinds of things that you can imagine where the RNA is functioning as RNA on chromatin or as a scaffold for binding protein. So my guess is something like that's going on with exist rather than the things I'm more used to for catalytic RNAs. Okay, and there's a question from um, Zoom. Would the stable RNA structure hinder the transcription? Would the stable RNA structure hinder the transcription? So that's a great question. Um, I t there, there, are, there are loving examples where a very stable RNA structure will affect the rate of transcription. HIV tar, I think, is an example of this. You get anti-termination effects in some systems. Um, there's also some cases where um, translation is hindered by very particular RNA secondary structures. But I think the default premise is partly because any RNA folds. So it's not like there's suddenly an RNA structure in a message and, some, and it's special. All RNAs are always folded, and so these have to be really special structures to get in the way of either transcription or translation and have an effect. The ribosome, for example, as part of the entry tunnel, is actually a super powerful helicase. It will plow through almost any secondary structure with almost no, no hindrance. So these have to be really particular structures to, to do something to, to the central dogma. 
question here in the middle. Thank you. I was wondering uh, if did you see any patterns across uh, species, different species? For example, if you use samples from um, closely related species versus um, you know far away related species, like um, different classifications, um, is there any sensitivity issues um, when you look at the closely related species in terms of you know the information you are getting from those uh, pair uh, pairwise matching? Yeah, this is a really important question. Thanks for the question. Um, conservation is a quantitative thing. Conservation to me means non-neutral. It's moving slower than the neutral rate. And so that can mean a whole wide range of things. And so what we do for structure predictions, say, is we need enough sequences in the right range of, you know, we need enough variation that we can see covariation, but not so much variation that we can't align the sequences to begin with because you've got to be able to lock on. You've got to be able to do a primary sequence alignment just to get started. So you need about 70 or 80% identity pairwise to be able to do that. And then if you have 99% identity, you don't get any covariation. You get less than 70%, you can't align the molecules. So there's a Goldilocks thing where for your particular RNA, you try to identify species at the right distance. And then what the right distance is depends on how fast, evolutionarily speaking, how fast you're particular molecule is moving. So there's examples where we'll be strictly with primate alignments because it's a rapidly moving RNA. And there's examples where like ribosomal RNA where uh, it's basically ultra conserved. And so then you're co comparing archaeal and bacterial sequences to get good covariations. Right. There are no more questions. It's, uh, thanks, Sean, again.